From the Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 10, beginning at verse 32. They were on the road, going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. They were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. He took the twelve aside and began to tell them what was going to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death. Then they will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit upon him and flog him and kill him, and after three days he will rise again. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it that you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or to be baptised with the baptism that I am baptised with? They replied, We are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptised you will be baptised. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those to whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognise as their rulers, lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Many of you will know the high esteem with which I regard Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. Her coronation portrait is actually just over here by my desk in my study. She watches me even now. Why do I esteem and regard her so highly? Is it because of the crown that she wears? Is it because of her ancestry? Is it because of her power? Is it because of what she represents? None of those things, really. They're all important in their own right, but for me, Her Majesty is an ideal example of what it means to be the servant of all. At her coronation, so many years ago, she took an oath before God to serve this people, to care, to look after, to guard and protect. And she has never stepped back from that oath as hard as it has been, and as much as it has demanded of her. In this passage, James and John want to be seated at Jesus' side in his glory. Perhaps they're imagining themselves on two thrones, side by side, when he has restored the kingdom of Israel. Jesus tells them, you don't know what you're asking. They think they do. Leadership is something to which few are called, but it is a position into which many are thrust, regardless of calling. We are put in positions of leading families, we are put in positions of leading churches. We are put in positions of leading teams at work. 
those who lead best are those who lead by example. They do not have to exercise their authority. They do not have to, as Jesus puts it, be tyrants over those in their care. They are among their teams, among their families, among their business co-workers, as those who serve. And it is those who serve best, most willingly, most graciously, who are looked up to by everyone else. Her Majesty is not looked up to because of her crown. Rather, the crown is looked up to and honoured because of Her Majesty. It derives its respected place because of the one who wears it. Why am I saying all this? It's not a, a political talk today. It's a talk about a scripture passage. Well, I'm saying it to remind us of what we should know about Jesus. He was son of God. Yet he did not cling to his equality with God. He did not hold on to his divine prerogatives, as the epistle to the Philippians tells us. But he became a servant. And as a servant, as the slave of all humanity, he has received glory and honour and praise and worship far above and beyond what he could have received as a grand ruler wielding a scepter by force. Our faith, the person at the centre of our faith, is profoundly subversive. The world's expectations of leadership, of rulership, of empire, are grandiose exercises of naked power. People may be obedient to such rulers, but they do not love them. They do not honour them, respect them, see them as truly great. The ones who are remembered as truly great are the ones who have been loved and who have served. We may never be ourselves crowned rulers of Europe, as much fun as that might be in some ways. We will be leaders in one position or another in our lives, even if it is simply amongst our family and friends. How will we lead when we are called to do so? Will we exercise force? Will we make demands? Or will we be servants? Will we lead because we are loved, not because we must be obeyed? That is the question this passage puts before us. And its answer is in the example of Jesus Christ. He came not to be served, though he could have demanded it, but he came to serve, to give and to save. That is his calling and as Christians, little Christs, it is ours also.